Thanks for joining us today. We are always encouraged to know that God is using this ministry to touch lives all across the world through what He's doing right here in Murfreesboro, Illinois. Please take a moment and share what God is doing in your life by sending an email to info at cccmurphy.com. We trust that you will be blessed by today's message. 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 38. And Elisha returned to Gilgal. Thank you. And there was a famine in the land. Now the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said to his servant, put on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word because it's life. God, help us to see this as more than a story and more than a book. And Father, it's life for us. You told us that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You made sure that through all these centuries that have passed, through all the ages, you've made sure that your Word was delivered to us. Now help us to glean from our walk with you through this Word. And we'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to talk to you for just a little while today on what's in your pot. Would you turn around and look at your neighbor and just ask them that question, what is in your pot? That's not a trick question. You know, there's all kinds of pots, aren't there? Some people smoke it. Some people sit on it. Literally. I was telling you, you know, when I was a little boy, my grandparents did not have inside plumbing. Well, when you're a little guy, the idea of walking down a sidewalk at midnight is not exactly... comforting so to spare me that walk they put a pot on the back porch and I thought you've got to be kidding me but there the life is filled with the unexpected and sometimes now what I, the pot I'm talking about today is our life everybody say my life consists of a pot. You never thought about that, did you? Some of us like crock pots. It just takes us a while to get going. We like to think about it. We put it in. We, you know, muse over it. We, we, we consider it. We contemplate it. We pray about it. And there's others of us that are like, you know, we're a boiling cauldron just ready to go at any moment. You're afraid of pressure cooker, some are pressure cookers. Anybody know a pressure cooker? <laughs> Any of you sitting next to one? You don't have to answer that. I'm just, you know what I'm talking about? It's just, you could go anytime, just, you know, don't touch it. Don't, my mom had a pressure cooker in the house and it had that, it, it, it makes a wonderful noise. But if you get near it, it'll blow up in your face. <laughs> Mom hollered at me, don't touch that. But here's, let, let me share the story with you that I read today. Elisha has come together with the sons of the prophets, and there's a famine in the land. Have any of you ever gone through a tough time? Anybody ever in here ever experienced when things weren't so good? when you didn't have a bumper crop, when you didn't get the promotion, when your car broke down and you didn't know what, you you understand, life just happens. Sometimes things don't go so well and we find ourselves in the middle of a famine. But here's what Elisha instructed them. He said, put on the great pot. What's he saying? He's saying, look, just because there's a famine in the land doesn't mean that you ought to quit trusting, that you ought to quit believing 
or that you ought to quit eating. How many of you remember hard times? Anybody in here lived during the depression? You say, pastor, I've been depressed all my life. <laughs> how many, let me, let me just ask it this way. How many of you remember when you didn't have a lot of groceries? Wave your hand, just hold your hand up if you remember when, a time when you didn't have a lot of groceries. I remember eating onion sandwiches. Not because we didn't have a lot of groceries, I just saw my mom do it. <laughs> and so I did, well, why did mom do it? Because my mom grew up in a depression and they ate everything on the pig except the squeal. Literally, pig's feet, I've had pig's feet, pig's tongue. I'd, I've never had a pig's ear. But I, they ate pig's ears, everything, everything. And, and why? Because it was tight. And you don't just quit eating. Let me put it to you in plain language. Just because you start going through something doesn't mean you quit praising God. Just because things get tight doesn't mean that you ought to quit loving God. You've got to make sure that you're putting the right things in the pot. And so what happened when he said, set that great pot on, it wasn't like they had, could run down to the grocery and pick up some meat. As a matter of fact, there wasn't any meat to put in the pot. They went out and they started gathering herbs. How many of you have got an herb garden? Nobody, how many of you use herbs when you cook? How many of you know what an herb is? Okay. We, we, we were growing herbs at our house. What was the herb? Basil? Was it basil? Yeah, recently. Basil? I think it was basil. I didn't know that you were supposed to water that and, and keep it. You know, you're supposed to use that stuff, you know, at a certain time. Whatever it was we had turned into a tree. It was, it, we were gone. What was it? You ate them off. She was eating trees at the house. Okay, she ate the leaf off. She said she ate the leaf off. But what happened? My daughter, we were gone when we were up in Kentucky. I forgot all about that plant. My daughter came by and she said, Dad, she said, your, your herb, is, it, it got hard. And, it, you, and how many of you know herbs are supposed to be tender? You know, and, and so if you let things go, they can go to pot. Literally. And so what happened is the, this guy goes out and he starts gathering herbs and he's looking for things to put in that pot. And all of a sudden, unwittingly, he didn't do it on purpose, but un, un, unwittingly, he grabbed a wild gourd that was poisonous. And he cut that thing up, shredded it, and he put it in that pot and the scripture said that when they tasted the pot or tasted the stew that was in the pot, all of a sudden, those prophets started yelling at Elisha and said, Father, there's death in the pot. Did you ever have something not turn out the way you expected it to? You had a plan and your plan went haywire. You had it all worked out, you had it all figured out, and then it didn't turn out the way you anticipated it. And it's like, man, this is about to kill me. This is, this is just wearing on my last nerve. How many of you have ever heard that as a child from your parents? You are on my last nerve. Some of you act like you still hear that from time to time. <laughs> In other words, what I'm saying is this, is it's you've gone as far as you can go. And that's why it's important that you take care what goes in this pot. Because whatever goes in does what? Help me out here. Whatever goes in comes out. So they did that, and, and, and death got in that pot. And then all of a sudden, the prophet came by, and he said, look, you can't throw out 
the baby with the wash water. Well, he didn't say it that way. But this is what he, he's saying. You can't throw it all away just because it didn't come out the way you anticipated. Hang here with me for a second. You see, because life doesn't come out the way we anticipate, sometimes we're ready to throw it all away. He gave you life. Just because things don't go the way you wanted them to or the way you anticipated does not mean that he gave up on you. So don't you give up on life. I knew a young lady that tried to kill herself. She'd gotten so messed up, she was on drugs. She'd, you know, her, her life had been a wreck for years. Couldn't get anything straight, and Debbie was going to talk to her. And I told Debbie, I said, tell her this. I said, she, she failed at killing herself. I t- tell her to act like she succeeded. And she doesn't have a life anymore. She was getting ready to throw her life away, so she needs to act like she succeeded. She doesn't have a life anymore. Instead of throwing it away, it's time to give it away to Christ. It's time to quit trying to navigate your own boat, to float it, and it's time to say, God, here I am. Use me. Heal me. Order my steps, God. Because I've misstepped so many times. Where's Kathy at? Is Kathy Lipe in here? She's not in here. I'm going to talk about her. (laughs) No, I'd tell her this if she wasn't here. Uh, Here a while back, Kathy made a misstep. She was stepping out of a, no, she was stepping into a room and she forgot there was a step up. And so how many of you saw her black eye? She had a black eye because she missed that step and she fell into that room and thank God she didn't get seriously hurt. What's your point? You're not going to get through life without missteps. How many of you in here have ever tripped before? Hold your hand up if you've ever fallen, if you've ever tripped. And what happens when we trip? We always blame it on what was in the way. We never think about the fact that if we had been looking at what was in the way, we wouldn't have tripped over it. But we we immediately look at, well, that stupid step when they put that there. I I, I remember walking through the house one time. It was dark. Don't ask me why I didn't turn the lights on. I figured I could navigate my way, and that's what we do. We think we can handle the journey. And so I started walking through the house and man, I hit my foot on somebody's shoe, nearly twisted my ankle. And I'm thinking, man, who left their shoes in the middle of the floor? I can't believe my wife didn't pick up my shoes. See, it's amazing how it's always somebody else's fault. It's all, it's all you know, it, it, and we messed up. But here's what happened. When the prophet heard that what was in the pot was poison, he didn't throw the pot away. Instead, he put flour. Everybody say flour. He put flour in the pot and he said, now eat it, and when they ate it with the flour in it, it was healed. Everybody say healed. I want you to keep that in mind. Flour healed it. I thought about life, our lives, and I thought about how that sometimes we find death in the pot. I mean, think about Jesus. Jesus goes through a circumstance when he says, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. What's Christ doing? He's letting you know you haven't been any place he hasn't already navigated. Your circumstance may be different, but he understands what it feels like to die. He understands what it feels like to face something that's killing him on the inside. And he goes to God and he says, Father, if there's any way, take this pot from me. Let this cup pass 
from me. I don't want this in my pot. I remember as a kid when I would, you know, get up in the, the morning, you know, and mom would make me oatmeal. How many of you remember oatmeal? No, not oatmeal. Is it oatmeal? What's this other stuff? Malta meal, malta meal. How many of you have ever had malta meal? So mom would make me malta meal, you know, and, and she would, and then some, she worked nights, so sometimes she didn't get up and my sister Deborah made it. And, De- and I never wanted to eat Deborah's malto meal. Why? Because it had lumps in it. I said, you know, and, and so sometimes we don't like what's in our pot. And it's like, you know, and I, here I am, and forget the fact that, you know, she's, she, was, oh, she was my older sister, but instead of thanking her for trying to at least fix me something, I was blaming her for her lumps. You're going to have to learn how to take the lumps in life, folks. Because sometimes lumps just come along with life. And then she, she worked it out where she got the lumps. She got rid of the lumps. She conquered malto meal and she got rid of the lumps. And then all of a sudden, but she, see, mom put on the milk first and then the sugar and Deborah put the sugar on first and then the milk. And I pushed away from the table. I said, that's not how mom does it. I'm telling you, sometimes we just get a little nuts, don't we? Some, I mean, have you ever gone back to a time in your life and started reviewing what you did and think, wow, I can't believe I did that? Has anybody done that besides me in this place? I can't believe I did. I know those of you that didn't raise your hands said no, but there have been a few times. So I said, wow, I can't believe they did that. Because <laughs> it's always somewhat right. And so Jesus understood what it was to taste death in the pot. And folks, sometimes there are people that try and throw that stuff in our pot. Paul said, look, I, three times I received 39 lashes from the Jews. They beat me three different times. He said, I was stoned once and left for dead. I spent a night and a day out in the open sea. He said, I've been in danger in the country. I've been in danger in the city. I've been in danger from my own countrymen. Every place Paul went, he was facing something. But Paul never allowed what somebody else put in that pot to take away the joy that God had put in him. And so Paul says, to them, he said, why are you trying to break my heart? Not only am I ready to give my, not only am I ready to be bound for this gospel, but I'm ready to give my life for this gospel. He said, none of these things move me. God help us. Not to allow circumstances to get the best of us. Not to let situations that come unexpectedly all of a sudden to begin to dictate to our joy. God wants us to be stronger than that. Us to be better than that. But I thought about the paradigm of life and how things shift. I thought about how Christ tasted death and And Paul had people trying to force death on him. But then I thought about how sometimes we're the ones that put death in the pot. Not knowingly, not intentionally, but it happens. So for the next few moments, if you would, I want to illustrate for you how sometimes death gets in our pot. Oh, I got to make this stew. Yes, sir. I got everything I need here. Going to make some great stew. That truck I just bought, a four-wheel drive, like we've always wanted when we were younger. Monster motors. Really? 400 horse turbo diesel power. Did you see chrome wheels? Did you see? You want to come for a ride? We've always talked about getting trucks when we were younger. Let's go for a ride. Let's go. You got a truck? Yeah. yeah it's awesome. It's blue, Caribbean blue. You ought to see it's the coolest truck. That's great. 
Let's go for a ride. You got a truck, huh? Yeah. You don't want to come for a ride? The black one? It's blue. It's, it's blue? It's blue. And it's fast. It, oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's incredible. That's fantastic. I can't, I can't, I can't come for a ride right now, but maybe sometime soon, okay? Soon. Yeah. Have a great day. Can't believe he got that truck. I, I mean, he knew I liked that truck. That was, that was my truck. He's driving my truck. God, I prayed about that truck. I marched around it seven times. I declared it. I named it and claimed it. And he's got it. I'm not going to let it get me down. I'm just going to keep on loving you, God. Rick, how are you doing? I haven't seen you in so long. Oh, hi. Hi. How are you? Wait a minute. Has anyone ever told you that the most beautiful eyes? <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. They're Caribbean blue. <laughs> Hey, you, do you, have you ever gone on a cruise to the Caribbean? I'd like to. <laughs> oh, and your hands. Your hands. Oh, you, got, you have got the sexiest hands. Oh. I got oh. another one right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, think about it. You know, I was checking some deals online. Yeah. Those eyes. <laughs> no, I've got eyes only for you. <laughs> Are you done with me? <laughs> Unless the other person shows up, we're in trouble. <laughs> oh, there's... Wait, wait. Where are you going? Oh, and there is such a party. Anybody who's... Anybody is going to see there. a party? <laughs> a party? We're going to go drinking. Woo! Oh. A party? A party. <laughs> right now? Yes. You can wear your Caribbean blue shirt but to match I, your blue eyes. I have to work. Let's go. Marie, you are so silly. <laughs> I, I have to work. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, You're you going to be so bummed out. It's, it's just time to, so time time to get out of town. Woo! I'm so pumped. Let's get out of here. Let's go. <laughs> y'all oh, oh, leaving without me? My loser. <laughs> Bye. I never get to go to a party. Everybody else is always going to parties. Rick, huh? what is taking you so long? The stew is taking forever. I have a whole restaurant full of people out there. You're moving in two speeds, slow, and stop. <laughs> I'm, I, now, I'm hey, working on hey, it. Hey, get your butt in gear or you're out of here. I can, I'll tell you the what. There are some things worth waiting on. Tell me. Let him come back out here again. He'll be in that stew. I make the best stew in the world. Nobody. My, I use secret ingredients. Sometimes I don't even know what's in that pot. Really? Oh, Look. oh, oh. Here, wait, well, wait, it's almost done, okay. it's almost done. Here. Well, let's taste it, shall we? Yeah. Here, here you go. What do you think? It's pretty good. Good. You all right? What's wrong? <laughs> girls, girls, wait! Give my hand, which <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> what we don't recognize is sometimes life distracts us. We know better than to put certain things in our pot. We know better than to allow certain things in our heart, but we get distracted. And in the distraction, we let things creep in 
maybe not intentionally, but those things begin to play havoc in our life. We may begin to envy someone because they've got something we don't. We may get caught up in lust because someone's paying attention to us and flirting with us and then all of a sudden it's just a game and we're only going to go so far but sin will take you farther than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay. Well, it may be that sometimes we just get angry because, you know, it's not fair. I never read anywhere in Scripture that life would be fair. I just read that Jesus would be there. (laughs) That he'd never leave you or forsake you, but he'd go with you. And so unwittingly, we let these things in our life that then begin to permeate in our soul, and they destroy us. I've seen people carry bitterness for years. Long after the people were gone, that they were upset with, but they still carried it. And they didn't realize it, but they became a trap of their own circumstances. It wasn't that person, that individual did not have dominion over them any longer. They were no longer trapped in that circumstance, but in their mind, they replayed it and relived it. And it stayed with them their entire life. But Jesus never intended that for us. Jesus wanted us to experience life more abundantly. What do you mean more abundantly? A life that supersedes your circumstance. A life that moves beyond what you're facing in the natural. You know, I've had people that that have met us before, and I, I never forget Debbie's dad, they had, they had experienced so much tragedy. They had lost their, their he lost his mother. He, they, both she and her, her, her dad and her mom had lost their parents. Then they lost a daughter in a car accident and a grandchild at the same time. She was on her way to the hospital to have the baby and that car was torn apart in the middle of an intersection, broke his neck, killed the, their daughter and the unborn child. Shortly after that, they lost another son that had been believed to be pushed off a third-story apartment building ledge. And he stood at the casket and people came by and I was close enough to overhear someone say, how can you still have a smile after all you've been through? And he looked at him and he said, because I know Jesus still loves me and he still cares. Do you understand? Sometimes we allow circumstances to cause us to think that God doesn't care. The Bible said that God commended his love toward us and that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And so if you ever wonder, does he care? Just look at Calvary. The answer is yes, yes, a thousand times yes. He cares. But what do we do? How how can I break away from it? How can I find healing? What brought healing to that pot for the prophet? Flower. You understand that the Old Testament is types and shadows. In the Old Testament, it's Jesus concealed But in the New Testament, it's Christ revealed. And so in the Old Testament, the prophet brought flour. But it symbolized bread that would come. They said, once the flour hit the pot, everything was made right in the pot. (laughs) The poison no longer had effect on them. It was canceled out by the power of the flower. Oh, you from the 60s remember flower power. (laughs) 
But when Christ came, when Christ came in the, the John, the sixth chapter, there's a dialogue that goes back, and I want to give that to you in plain English if I can. Jesus had shown up, and they were looking at him, and they said, look, if you're, if you're the one, then, then what sign do you show, and, and, and what miracle will you perform? Because our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. Moses gave our fathers manna, and Jesus looked at him and said, your fathers ate manna, and they're all dead. He said, Moses didn't give you that manna. He said, my father in heaven gave that manna. And he said, he brings the real manna. He brings the real bread. Uh, and you, if you eat that bread, and you, you're never, never, never going to be hungry anymore. They said, well, give us some of that bread. And he said, I am uh, the bread of life. Uh, when you eat my flesh, uh, you'll never hunger again. Uh, but it was hard for them. They couldn't receive it. Why? Because it didn't happen the way they thought it could happen the way they thought it should happen. They said, now, wait a minute. We know his mother. His brothers are among us. This is Jesus, Joseph's boy. If you're not careful, you'll always try and talk yourself out of a miracle. You're, you will talk yourself out of the joy God intended for you to have. You'll begin to look at everything. You'll look at all the poison and all the junk that went in the pot instead of looking to the bread that can heal it. Think about it. Think about what happens when you add bread to the pot. When you go to Panera, what do they give you with your broth bowl? Why? Say that loud. It soaks it up. Do you understand? That's, what, that's why Christ came. He came to soak up all the stuff that keeps trying to tear you down. He came to soak up the anger, the jealousy, the anguish. The Bible said that he became sin that knew no sin. When that bread hit my pot, it started soaking up everything that was wrong with me. It started soaking up everything that was destroying me. And the only thing that was left in that pot was life. Life forevermore. So it's time to say, God, here I am. Don't reject the bread. I know people that go to Panera and they won't eat the bread. What's the bread for? <laughs> Come on, folks. We just had this history lesson. It's there to soak it up. Everybody say, soak it up. When I, the first time I went to Russia, I flew through Finland. I, threw, I flew on Fin Air. They brought the tray out, and the tray had a roll. Everybody say, a roll. And I grabbed the roll, and I was expecting to butter it. And I tried to tear it open, and it would not tear. I took the bread and started pounding it, literally, started pounding it on the little tray that you let down in the seat. And the person in front of me thought, what is the guy doing? I started looking around because I thought I was on candid camera. Somebody gave me rock for bread. And it's too hard, I can't penetrate it. Stay with me here. The Bible said that when Moses struck that rock the second time, he didn't get to go in. Why? Let me tell you, that rock is Christ. And there's nothing the devil can throw at him that can penetrate. There's nothing the devil can put on him that can break him. 
he faced hell itself and came back victorious. He said, I have the keys to death, hell, and the grave. But do you know what he does for us? He does not show himself that stone, that rock, but when he touches our life, he becomes that soft bread that allows us to soak it up, that lets us wrap our arms around his presence and know that he loves us and it extracts everything that's trying to destroy us. Lazarus is dead. He's been dead for four days. And Mary and Martha are between a rock and a hard place. They said, if you'd been here, oh, come on, how many of us have ever been there in our life? God, if you'd have just shown up on time. The situation goes beyond what we anticipated would happen. The circumstances moves past the perimeters we created for it. And we're left wondering, where's God? Martha said, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Mary looks at him with disappointment. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. And what's he do? He doesn't come at them hard. You remember, even all the Jews are looking around, and the Jews make this statement, and they said, if this man that had opened the eyes of the blind and made the lame to walk had been here, couldn't he have even caused that Lazarus would not have died? And the Bible said that Jesus groaned when they said that. He didn't groan at Mary, and he didn't groan at Martha. But when the Jews said that, he groaned. And the word groan in Greek means to snort with anger. Are you trying to say that it's beyond my reach? Are you trying to say that I'm not big enough to handle what they're going through? How long do I have to be with you before you recognize who I am? But to Martha, he said, your brother will live again. To Mary, he said, where have you laid him? And he that was a rock to others moved the rock for them. He said, roll away the stone. And Martha's afraid. Haven't we been there? We're afraid to let God in. We're afraid things have gotten too messy. We're afraid things have deteriorated too much. And Martha's trying to keep him out, Lord. It's been four days. He stinks by now. His body, his body's in a mess. But here's the good news. It's no matter what kind of mess you're in, he's able to restore you. He's able to redeem you. He's able to speak life where there's been no life. And he cried out, Lazarus, come forth. And death that had been in the pot was now transformed to life. Look at your neighbor and say, don't reject the bread. Would you stand with me today? We never intend for it to happen. We never mean for it to happen. I, I, I want you to think about it. Something that was good, if it were treated the right way, it's now just become chopped up mess. Why? Because we didn't let God have it. We tried to handle it ourselves. I love corn on the cob, but the idea of having to try and butter that, <laughs> it's just not enough to sustain me. Don't let life chew you up and spit you out. Give it to God. See, it wasn't just the corn that wound up in that pot. The corn husk wound up in there. The corn silk wound up in there. Why? 
simply because I was distracted, simply because something was robbing me of my focus. I only get one life, one opportunity. I now don't misunderstand, I've already made up my mind that I'm living for God. But I get one opportunity to share this pot. When the prophet told him, he said, sit on the great pot. He was talking about, he, this is what he was saying. He was saying, I want you to prepare for everyone else during a time of famine so they can be satisfied. Too many times we're the only one eating from the pot. We become like a Jacob in the fact that we don't want to share. And then in an Esau in the fact that we'd cash everything in for one moment of pleasure. But God has called us to represent him. Say, but I don't feel like I'm able. Look. In 1 John, he said, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. This isn't about you, it's about him. Paul tells us in Romans 8 and 38, I believe it is, that nay, in all these things, we've been made more than conquerors through him that loved us. And you want to hear the exciting thing? The, the, the great news? Listen to what he tells us. Listen to what he says to us in Revelations 3 and 20. Look at me, this is in the message, look at me. I stand at the door, I knock. If you hear me and call and open the door, I'll come right in and sit down to supper with you. Conquerors will sit alongside me at the head table, just as I, having conquered, took the place of honor at the side of my father. That's my gift to the conquerors. And Paul said we've been made more than conquerors through him that loved us. Quit feeling like you're not enough and you don't count and you don't matter. You got exactly what you need to make a difference in someone else's life. But until you get bread in that pot, nothing's going to change. Greater is he that's in me. You have to let him in. Remember what he said, I'm knocking. I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. If you'll open it up, I'll come in. Sometimes we go to church all of our life, but we really never let him in. Oh, we love him. We sing with the congregation in songs, but we never really let him in. See, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the difference between just making stew and sharing stew. When that manager came by and took a drink of all that turmoil and all that jealousy and all that envy and all that anger I'd put in that pot, it killed him. But you know what? After the bread headed, it changed. I'm not the same as I used to be. I've been changed. Would you love him with me right now? I'm going to ask the prayer partners to come up if they would. I don't know if you can smell it, but if you could put your nose over that pot, it smells pretty good. But you see, it takes God to sort it all out. I got some of the right stuff in there, and I also got some of the wrong stuff in there. Anybody ever been there before? Any of you ever had a bad thought? Oh, thank God you all walk on water around here. 
you ever have a bad day turned into a week stretched over into a month and then you thought dear God is my life ever going to change the, new, the good news is yes it'll change but when as soon as you open the door as soon as you open the door and let the bread in so this is what I'm going to ask you to do today if you're in this place and you say pastor I'm ready to get death out of my pot there's some things that I've allowed to get into my life that I need to get out of my life it's not that you don't love God it's not that you're not saved it's not that you you don't care it's that it just slipped in unexpectedly you weren't focused and when you weren't focused it slipped in but today Jesus said whosoever will let them come and I'll give them life you may be walking in depression and yet God wants to give you a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness you may feel like you're always alone and yet God wants to baptize you with his spirit so that you know that you're never alone and all you have to do is say here I am God right here right now would you do it as they sing this song I'm going to ask you to come right now place and you say I need something to change I want you to come right now very quickly it may be healing for your body whatever it is he's able he's able oh, stretch those hands down thank you Father thank you Father let him do it for you right now Father I love you I need you God Father, I love you. I love you. Let me, let me share this with you. Sometimes we want to smell what's cooking on the stove, but we don't want to taste it. We don't want to partake of it. Why? Because I'm not sure what it tastes like. This young man, I don't know if that's ever happened to him before. Well, can you explain that? Absolutely. Because the God we serve is a huge God the Bible said that no man can see him and live so if he touches you friend you're not just going to be able to stand there calm cool and complacent something's going to happen some weep some cry and others are just overwhelmed why don't you let him overwhelm you today come on stretch your hands right where you're at and say God here I am here I am it is when brethren dwell together in unity how many of you like to have someone with you you don't like to be all alone you like it when someone's with you I thought about this week during VBS 
there was a young lady and I don't even know if she's in the building today but there was a young lady that came into the building and my wife met her and walked over to her and started to talk to her and hug her she was just overwhelmed there was just so much stuff in her pot and as Debbie began to break bread <laughs> And she began to share Christ with her. That woman just started weeping. And she said, I'm so ready. I am so ready. And she gave her heart to God right out there in the lobby during VBS. Just poured her heart out to God. Forever changed. Forever changed. That can happen for you right now. You don't have to go home the way you came. And all it takes is saying, Lord, here I am. Rescue me, forgive me, save me. And his answer to you is, yes, I will. Yes, I will. As he reaches out to hold you in his arms. Would you let him do that right now? Just raise your hands and let him hold you right now. Father, thank you for it. life in your pot no despair there just hope and there's no they listen all that grief and sorrow is being replaced with joy unspeakable and full of glory come on and give my hand clap of praise in this house today thank you father as they continue to pray i want to pray for you remember right immediately following service we're going to be in abba java with a dedication and memory of Ron Catlett.
But I want to pray for you right now. Father, I thank you for our family. God, we're not acquaintances and we're not strangers, but we're family. We love each other in this house. You told us in your word that we know when we pass from death unto life. Said when we love our brothers and sisters, God, I feel life in this house today. I pray, Father, that you keep your hand upon us. Bless my family, God. Make them the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Let them know that they're never alone. I pray that you heal every sickness. God, that you undo every curse that's ever been spoken against us. And that God, you guide us and become all in all to us in Jesus' name. Come on, give me one more hand clap of praise. God bless you today.